Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. And uh, I would like uh, to invite uh, the speakers, uh, Bill, Andrea, uh, Stefan, Jerome, and Anita to join for the panel. Uh, Germain will probably uh, help me also with the questions, I don't know, and, and the rest of the audience. Um, so, Hold on, everybody. We don't, we got, we're all good. Oh, yeah, is, uh, yeah, okay, so um, okay, so we're uh, I invite the audience also to uh, to ask questions, but maybe to just uh, kick off, uh, uh, Anita um, and others. Uh, what do you think is the first challenge we have to deal with when we want to be ready uh, for the migration to a quantum secure status? Yes, uh, well, also, the, uh, I'm very happy that the other speakers also mentioned it. It's uh, knowing uh, what cryptography you have in use. That's the first topic, because when you don't identify your assets, then you don't know your risks and you don't know what you have to migrate. So uh, that's, that's the first, first main challenge, uh, because a lot of people talk about uh, new cryptography, it's uh, exciting, it's challenging, but no, having the basics, <laughs> that, that, that's our first concern. Uh, yeah, if I, uh, when Bill uh, gave uh, his talk, uh, he also mentioned this National Center of Excellence in the United States. And my understanding now is a little bit that this sort of technological question and all these practices that are necessary to aid migration uh, are, are sort of part of, of such an effort uh, of, of a national center. Do we have such a thing in the Netherlands? Do we have it in Europe? Should we have it? Yes, we should, because uh, you saw you saw uh, at the, at the, the previous slide of this one, you saw this uh, uh, chemical, uh, and that that's what we want to talk with you about uh, tomorrow, because we think uh, that that that's uh, that's what we need in in the Netherlands also and on European level. You one? see it, expertise center. Yes, there it is. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, we need it. We need it, and we are we are trying to build it. Uh, so I really like to talk to uh, to NIST about it as well. Uh, how to do this? Yeah, yeah. Because is, is it uh, is it true that uh, that perhaps in uh, Germany or in France such an expertise center is already uh, being established or is envisioned? Uh, how does it work there? Uh, the, for us, expertise, we are trying to, to build expertise both at the uh, national sec cyber security agency level and also uh, working uh, very closely with uh, different university and research centers uh, to, to build the, the given expertise. I believe that uh, in, uh, at least in, uh, in France, I hope that it is the same in Germany, that there, there does exist uh, uh, sufficient uh, mass of expertise at the uh, university and the research level and uh, we try to work with them very closely. Uh, so there are publications, uh, uh, scientific publications shared between the NC and the universities. Uh, we do follow, the, follow all the seminars and so on on this topic. So we are not that worried about expertise Is right now. Does that also involve uh, like uh, active engagement of industry? Yes. France has a lot of yes, industry. Um, and yes. Uh, um, okay. Uh, um, lots of uh, those uh, researchers are actually PhDs working uh, in uh, private companies. Yeah, yeah, that's that's actually a, it's a huge community uh, mm. in France. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. So I, I think that this expertise center idea that could even be a European uh, idea because a lot of uh, collaboration on a European level uh, is necessary, uh, possibly. And I think in Andrea's mm. talk uh, we have also seen, uh, you know, uh, this this idea strongly uh, being promoted. Um, okay, Andrea, can you can you explain uh, what what steps need to be taken mm -hmm. before Europe can uh, join uh, forces among its member states <laughs> and uh, establish an expertise center and uh, etc. How far yeah, away I, I are think we uh, removed from such an ideal state? I really, really enjoy the sessions because it really shows 
the struggles that we um, that we just have every single day. Like for example, if we put together uh, the talks from uh, the colleague from VSI and and from ANSI, that really shows that there is no common agreement. Like there is no agreement. Um, there is agreement in some parts, but not in, in a general sense as to be able to say, okay, we're all agreeing this, therefore we need a strategy, and this is what we're going to put in a strategy because the 27 are going to say this is the way to go. But when, when you were saying, and you were speaking about these excellent centers, uh, at the European Union level, we have this ECCC in Romania that just opened a few months ago uh, as a European, European Union Com Cybersecurity Competence Center. It has like a really, really long name. I would, I would like to see uh, that center to precisely host more conversations about this and even like have a unit around this. So I think there is like a lot of room uh, to do things, yet uh, we still need to go and give the first step, which is like trying to put member states together, say, okay, urgent, we can uh, disagree on this thing, and then we'll sit down again in a, in a year and say, okay, maybe we can expand this. But um, but that's like the, the main challenge, of course. But when it comes to excellence and competence centers, yes, the EU should have one. Like we have one for hybrid threats, for instance. So why not? So uh, I want to comment on that because uh, cybersecurity is um, very much in, uh, it is uh, the way Europe works, it's, uh, it's not as federal as uh, Germany or the US. Uh, it's very much um, um, state level, uh, I, I, I mean uh, security in general and uh, uh, cybersecurity in particular is very much uh, uh, a sovereign competence of the states in Europe. So mm -hmm. it is uh, handled by the states themselves and they, don't, they want to keep sovereignty on that. And this is why this is for now handled I mean, uh, on the guidelines point of view, this is under the state level because this is very much a state prerogative. Of course, the expertise is shared quite freely mm -hmm. between the states uh, because uh, this is exactly the way the EU works currently. Uh, it is a, a union of states. It is not a federal structure. Yeah, right exactly, now. but when it comes to cyber policy, there is like a big, big framework of regulations and all the rest that are, like, are agreed at the European Union level, and then they're implemented by member states. Classical cybersecurity, now that we're speaking about quantum, is something that we can see like that the EU has had like a really like, strong um, like uh, push to really like try to harmonize uh, the level of cyber security across the union. I mentioned this too during my presentation. Uh, we are now thinking cyber resilience acts, cyber solidarity acts, so on and so forth. So uh, certain things are indeed like sovereign competence of member states, but precisely I think that's one of the big issues that we're facing in quantum, uh, because it's everybody thinks about this as as as, um, as something that is like damaging national security. Therefore, this conversation should not go to the EU. But as I mentioned, for example, when we talk, it goes much beyond. It goes about like like democracy and trust in digital in digital tools, which is something the EU is working a lot. It goes uh, to economic competitiveness as well. So I think that it's we that's perhaps another lesson for us, right? Um, like try to just like really like encourage like that awareness that it's much more than a security, security, security topic. It's something that is like all encompassing. But that's like something that we can we can discuss like uh, later because it's true that like France is always like a very difficult uh, member of things <laughs> like go and drag in this type of conversations. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So so uh, you know let's let's leave the European uh, sphere and then let me introduce uh, the next question I have. Yeah. So I, I witnessed a discussion on uh, on on uh, you know uh, semiconductors uh, as a uh, you know. Uh, uh, um, uh, chip in, in, in global politics, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and also some trouble in, in the relationship, transatlantic relationships yes. about, uh, you know, trade restrictions and so mm -hmm. forth. And I was at a somewhat, well, it was, uh, you know, good hearted, but also tense uh, discussion about that. And, you know, that, that discussion was just asking for the remark, but wait a minute, we've just had the NIST competition in, in cryptography, which is a mm -hmm. great example of, of global or transatlantic, but also with Asian country's example of uh, collaboration. So, uh, you know, cheer up. So my question is, <laughs> I mean, it's a completely different industry, of course, and, uh, you know, but, uh, you know. So my question then is, <clears throat> if the NIST competition itself, competition between quotation marks, that were, those were nicely on the slides, uh, if, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, if that was such a great example of international collaboration, should also the migration be, uh, you know, uh, uh, much more of a collaboration. So we're talking here about, you know, European uh, uh, European states, EU states joining. Shouldn't, shouldn't it be bigger, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm so sorry to be speaking all the time. Um, you mentioned transatlantic, and um, we have been working a lot within the framework of the Trade and Technology Council. 
And uh, we don't know what's going to happen at the end of the year if there's going to be another one. But the previous one, uh, there was a new work stream added of transatlantic collaboration precisely in post-quantum cryptography. I would really like to know what's happening there because I'm sure it's going to be uh, like very, very useful for have things happening on both sides. Maybe you have more information about it. Yeah. Yeah. Is Bill, uh, how does that look from the U.S. perspective? Like, uh, well, we can do this on our own or maybe... No, no, absolutely not. Um, I'm not sure this is on, but... Uh, our, our collaboration at the center has companies from all over the world, so so we recognize it's not a U.S. only thing. Yes. Um, what, what I'm what I'm I kind of want to drop back a little bit and cheat. Communications and the levels of how you're communicating is super important because you walk into a room and and you're asking them to, to be to do something and and some of them have no ability to take action that day and others in this room can take action on on something within their hardware today so there's this this need for us to start to synchronize with the next time they put out a, a really good guidance document or the germans or the, you know the Spanish, anybody we should find a way to be hey what can i say about it in a blog post so that we don't let this stuff get missed as as it's because right now we're we're sort of hitting a ball over net and sometimes it comes back and, and we really need to be a little more eye open and, and that's hard because I'm not a communicator I am but I, I'm an engineer first and, and this is a whole new skill of collaboration that, that's required so. yes. Yeah. yes may I add something to that because I think uh, we need to collaborate I, I, I agree with you totally but I also think that uh, there are good initiatives all over the world and um, you can't make them that because you say, hey, we have to put it together in one big, and then it explodes before, it's had, before, be, before it has got uh, a chance to get started. I really believe in, you should have all these expertise centers all over the world, but they should be connected and learn from each mm -hmm. other because they're very good initiatives and every initiative is valuable. Mm -hmm. So it, it should, uh, can survive their own, but we must learn from each other so we can do it efficiently. Yes, yes, I think it makes a very uh, important point. Yes, I, I would also completely agree. So I think, I mean, we certainly need to coordinate, that's that's for sure, but that's something we're already doing. And um, I would object a little bit to what you said. That, I mean, I, I don't think, in, I mean, as Jerome uh, emphasized, I think we, we are agreeing on most uh, of the things and there are some nuances that we don't mm -hmm. agree on. And that's a result of uh, us talking to each other, actually. And so I, I think we're doing that on the European level and uh, we're also talking to the US and we're talking to NIST. Um, and uh, I think we're learning a lot from each other. Uh, what can certainly help is probably um, at the European level to have some coordination efforts. Um, yes. I'm, I'm sure of that. I, so I, I really I, agree. I, I have a follow-up question uh, then uh, maybe uh, to you, uh, mm. Stefan. So uh, Germany, but also France, have within Europe, within the EU, been you know, uh, front runners uh, in, in the PQC uh, domain after uh, the uh, NIST competition uh, was initiated. Uh, front runners in, in, in informing the, the public in, in, at all levels, at the mathematical level even, at the policy level, you know, for many, many years, both France and Germany, and after some point also uh, the Dutch government has uh, chipped in. Uh, so uh, there may be other initiatives within the EU that, that I am not, not aware of, but from my perspective that, that sums it up pretty much. Should those three parties then also within Europe take the lead to make sure that there this coherence that Anita uh, uh, addresses huh? uh, a coherence between national efforts. Should these three parties then also uh, join forces to, to try to establish that? And, and if so, how? So I guess we're sort of doing that and uh, talking to each other, as, as we said, and trying to get uh, others aboard as well on the European level. I want to completely support what, uh, what Stefan said. said. Mm -hmm. uh, we already know each other quite well because we uh, see each other when cooperating on that. And uh, uh, to, um, to precise a bit more, uh, th there, is, uh, there are uh, such things as uh, European treaties which are delimiting the proper uh, competence domain of the member state and, the, and the, uh, the union. And this is completely within the competence of the state. So the best we can do right now is to cooperate at the member state level. And we are doing that with at least Germany and also with the Netherlands. And uh, we, we are trying to, to get uh, at least some agreement between us, and then maybe we can, uh, we can make some set of uh, European rules. Uh, but uh, this is 
this is completely a member state prerogative, so we are uh, doing the best that we can within the existing treaties. Yes. If, if I might add, the, yeah. in, in North America, the Canadians are awesome at this stuff, so let's not forget other other places yeah. to look, and in and, and South Korea, and Japan, and, and Australia, you've got lots of places to reach. It's time and energy and resources, and so earlier questions about why NIST, some of that was because NIST was willing to put the resources forward to start, and, and and you can hear sort of the, the, the agreement parts and then also the push. There's always going to need to be a push from all of us on each other. If we don't listen to each other and take feedback and, and half the audiences we're trying to reach are so busy doing other cybersecurity and privacy things, still cleaning up other messes in earlier instantiations that we don't get the feedback from them because they don't have time to give it. So we have to be uh, find a way to walk into those rooms and be like, Gen generous and, and anticipate what they need from us rather than give and say, here it is. So, Canada. I, uh, I want to, so this will seem strange coming from a French representative, but uh, uh, on these topics, as a uh, British are friends also. <laughs> Maybe the answer. I didn't dare to ask. <laughs> but I know, I know, I knew the answer, I guess. Okay, so maybe uh, I, I should also give the, uh, you know, I can go on forever like this. Uh, maybe should give the audience a chance to ask the panel. Uh, my name is Sven Zagala, Resquant. We manufacture, well, we're developing a hardware-based PQC uh, solution. And the question is, you know, with, at the moment, we have the NIST pretty much done, waiting for the first, uh, for, the, for the last, uh, solutions but for the European I don't know and the question is you know I have to put a push a button on a few million dollars worth of on cheap development do I wait and then it takes another two years to develop or do I push and do the next one so this is a real problem from business point of view and I think there is a value added to have a European chip designed in Europe made in Europe mm -hmm. for security reason in mm -hmm. cryptography okay just um, I, I do not work for the European Union. I'm not employed by the EU. So uh, that's, I think that's, it, it's good that I, that I say it. It's true that we work really, really closely because we're based in Brussels and literally 10 minute walk from, from each other. Um, and we really incorporate the EU in, in everything that we do, projects such as, for example, this one that we have been running for a couple of years. Um, what happened with NIST? Um, if, if last time that I looked at the competition um, of the teams, like the people from the teams that made up, that, you know, like, just like applied to this. I think there were like 24 researchers out of which 16 or 17 were Europeans. Uh, there is a lot of European talent that has gone to NIST to, to precisely because they took the leadership and like taking this. Um, is there like something going on in the EU? Yes, we have Sense and Elect, for example. There's like working groups in there, but most likely we're all going to follow what happens in NIST. Um, we can disagree, of course, like they know more from each of their, of course, like uh, like member states, like what, what what are the things they're looking at? But if you look at, for example, the presentations when both of them were mentioning like the post quantum algorithms, they, they were like NIST basically. So um, um, what does that mean? Um, just like taking the conversation perhaps a little bit broader, which is what do we do, what, what we do at the think tank level. That means that there was a, there was a really big opportunity for the EU to really spearhead this, um, but we didn't take it. And that's the reason why everybody went to NIST, which is not necessarily bad. It just means that there's definitely we need to have more conversations about what technological development means for Europe. What should Europe role be in all these processes and whether or not uh, we want to be ready for the next things to come, whether it's something as technical as standards or uh, just like this precisely PQC standards or whether it's like a conversation about like diplomatic power, regulatory power and other, and other types. I would like to see, for example, what's going on with the AI standards, for instance, that I know that there's a lot of work being done transatlantically on this, but that's like yet another example, right? Like that's that's probably the reason why when we speak about PQC, we, we cannot stop thinking or we cannot stop saying what's happening in NIST. Good. I have, can have one more question from the audience. I cannot. Um, Sorry, I've stolen it, I'm afraid. Um, firstly, thank you, Jerome, for the nice comments about the British and sorry about Brexit. Um, I guess my question is possibly aimed at Bill, but I welcome everybody's perspective. So crypto agility has been mentioned quite a few times. 
Uh, and I think we all agree it's really important. I'm slightly concerned that if we leave it just to industry to implement crypto agility, we're not going to do it because it's just more money to spend and means we can't sell people upgrades later. So I'm just wondering what role do you see NIST and, and related organizations taking in helping to not mandate, but kind of strongly encourage crypto agility? One tactic could be at our lab to, to find a way to to demonstrate more than one version of it, the hard part is sort of if we ask people to collaborate with us and, and that if we said, we're going to do one in this space, that would be a lot of people who wanted to maybe, it should, should be a lot of people. And so trying to, we got to do it in a way that doesn't look like we're picking winners, but picking technical frameworks that would support it. And so that's going to, that's a, that's a bigger project than I've thought of yet, but it could be a later part of our work stream within what we're doing. Okay. Uh, I think it also needs to, yeah, I'll stop there. there, there that's a tactic. Yes, I think uh, that's a- I'd like to uh, add something to it. Can sorry. I add, can I add something to that? Uh, yes, because uh, I think uh, crypto, uh, agility should not only be to crypto, but also to other uh, software libraries you build into uh, software. Mm -hmm. So I think it should uh, be combined in general and not just crypto. So I think it should be implemented in all our design principles that agility of external libraries, which must be able to be maintained or and other software components as well, just not focus only on crypto, but put it in general in all your design principles. I think that's, that's important. Thanks. Uh, I think that we are ready for lunch, but maybe I should invite uh, the panel also. Is there other people who want to make a final statement? An advice. <laughs> Go to lunch. Let them <laughs> yes. let's, let the British are good at the British are good at this too. How about that? Because we didn't say a lot. Of it. The British are good at this too. I <laughs> think. Good. Good. Then um, I thank the panel for their contributions and uh, also uh, thank the audience for the contributions and uh, I guess it's uh, lunchtime. Yeah, it's lunchtime. We will be back at two and please give up a hand for our chair for today, Ronald Kramer. In today's complex, fast-paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine-tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Entrust, securing a world in motion.